Good morning. Welcome to St. Luke's. Welcome home. I am Pastor Luca Taliano. It is my privilege to be able to lead worship here. Uh, this is home. And today's service is going to be a little provocative for some of us. We're going to be talking about something that is terrifying. Love. It's not a word that we throw around easily, and yet we throw around it really easily. I love this pizza! Man, that's the best stuff ever. But to look someone in the eyes and mean it, I love you. That's terrifying. It's scary. So I'm going to start off with a scary statement. I love you. As the pastor here, I know most of you in this room fairly well. And it has been an honor to serve here and continues to be. No, don't worry, I don't have a call, at least not to my knowledge. I'm going to continue to serve here. But I love you. And as we continue worship today, we're going to dig into this a little bit. And yeah, it might be a little scary. Let's go with it. Our opening hymn today talks about the love that Christians have for one another. We're going to begin with hymn number 497. This is my will. Let's worship the Lord. And I love you. Thanks, Lucy. We all love, love you. We all love you. When I said love, especially some of you guys might have gone, ugh. We are taught in our culture that love is something that is romantic. And certainly romantic love is a good thing, but that is not the only kind of love. There is a fierce love that can develop that is not romantic. A love that protects. Some of you who are military, former military, will recognize the love that happens between squad mates. That's not romantic, but it's very fierce and sacrificial. In our Old Testament lesson, we have an example of this non-romantic love that God calls us to demonstrate. Our first lesson is from 1 Samuel chapter 20. Then Jonathan said to David, By the Lord, the God of Israel, I will surely sound out my father by this time, the day after tomorrow. If he's favorably disposed towards you, won't I send you word and let you know? But if my father is inclined to harm you, May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I don't let you know and send you away safely. May the Lord be with you as he's been with my father. But show me unfailing kindness, like that of the Lord as long as I live, so that I may not be killed. And do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him, because he loved him as he loved himself. This is God's word. Our second lesson is 1 Corinthians 13. Some of you will find this very familiar. It's known as the love chapter of the Bible. Some of you may have heard it with weddings. In this chapter, God tells us what love looks like. Our second lesson is from 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. 
But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these... Is love. This is God's word. The verse of the day. Alleluia. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. I am the way, the truth, and the life, says the Lord. Alleluia. Now, out of respect of the words of the gospel, please stand. Let me set the scene. Jesus is about to die. It's Thursday night, and he's gathered with his disciples, and he's just told Judas, yes, you are the one who's going to betray me. And Judas breaks Jesus' heart as he leaves. And it is there, as Jesus loves even this man who betrays him, that Jesus speaks these words. Our gospel is from John chapter 13. When he, Judas, was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God's glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I'll be with you only a little longer. You'll look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This is God's gospel. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace all belong to you because of Jesus. Amen. I know the world you long for. It's not this world. This world is so broken. And you have been a victim of that brokenness time and time again. This isn't what you long for. Let me describe the world you long for. You don't envy anyone, and no one envies you. Because they're all content with what they have, and you are truly content with everything you have. It's a world where no one gets angry at you without first hearing your side of the story. They actually sit and listen to what you have to say because it really is important to them that they hear you. And you return the favor. You never get angry unless you first sit and listen to them. You don't owe anyone anything. Not money, not an apology, not something to pay back what you owe. You, you owe nothing. No, no one owes anything to you. This is the world that we long for. We yearn for that. We long for that kind of place. We long for a place where love wins. That's what we want. And it's not just what we want. It's actually the world that Jesus commands. Listen to this. Listen again to these two verses from the gospel that you listened to just a couple minutes ago. Jesus says, A new command I give you. 
Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. See, Jesus gives a new command. And he says it's new. For thousands of years before this, there's been a command. Ever since Moses, God had commanded his people, love your neighbor as yourself. And some of you know, Jesus actually said that as well. Love your neighbor as yourself. But there's a weakness in that command, and Jesus knows it. That's why he's giving this new one to complete it. See, there's a problem with that. And it's our first blanks on the insert. As you fill it in, it says, love your neighbor as yourself doesn't work because we don't love ourselves. That may sound weird to you. You may say, in this era of self-esteem and all that, of course we love ourselves. I'm not so sure. I think maybe we do love ourselves in ways we shouldn't. But you know you better than anyone else, don't you? You know every time you failed. You know every dark secret that you don't want anyone else to find out, that you haven't told anyone because you're scared that if you tell them, they'll reject you. You know your shame, and you know your sin, and you know your failures. And as you look at yourself, and you really look at those things, I don't love myself so much. I look at myself, and I don't feel love. I feel shame. And so when I hear, love others like I love me, well, that's really not that hard. Okay, I don't love you, because I don't love me. So there's a weakness there because of our weaknesses. Not because of the weakness of the commandment, but because of us. The commandment is good. We're not. And there's another problem with this. I heard a story yesterday from a teacher, and I kind of said, Oh, I'm going to steal that. And I told her, and she's fine with it, so don't worry about it. She was telling me about a student that she has in class that is constantly tapping his pencil all the time. And she's told the student to stop because, you know, it annoys her, it annoys other students. And the kid just keeps on tapping, and she disciplines him, and he just keeps on going. And she pulled the parents in and said, we got to deal with this. this you know, he's not stopping. And the parents said, well, it doesn't bother us, so it shouldn't bother you. They're loving her the way they love themselves. It doesn't bother us, so it shouldn't bother you. And we use that excuse all the time. Think about how many times you say, well, that's how I like it, so you should be fine with it. That's not love. That's using a command as an excuse to say, I want my way. Jesus doesn't say, love others the way that you love everything else. Love others the same amount that you love yourself. And so if you use the excuse, well, I like it that way, you're, you're not loving them. Doesn't mean that your preference is wrong. Your preference is probably fine. But understand that you're not loving others when you say that. And so there's a weakness in that command because we twist it and we turn it and we use it as an excuse to get our way. And so Jesus gives this new command. Love others, not the way you love yourself, the way I love you. That's the way you should love others. Some of you know that in Greek, there's a whole bunch of different words for love. And Greek makes it so much easier, because in English, we use love for so many things. In Greek, there's a word phileo. It means brotherly love. It's where we get the word Philadelphia. That word actually means city of brotherly love. It's where we get it. And phileo is a beautiful thing, and it is a strong thing, and it is a necessary thing. It's the kind of love that you have with others because you have something in common. Brotherly love. Yeah, I love my brother. He's a doofus, but he's my brother. I gotta love him. That's brotherly love. It's the kind of love that I mentioned earlier, squad mates have in the military. You may have nothing else in common, but because you're in the same unit, you back each other up. It's the kind of love that we have in this congregation. Let's face it, we are really different people compared to each other. But we are gathered together to learn from Jesus. And that bonds us together in phileo as we have this thing in common. And that's a good thing and a powerful thing. And Jesus says, as good as that is, it's not enough. 
Because the word he uses here when he says love each other is not phileo, it's agape. This is love that loves even when there is nothing in common. This is love that loves even if the other person is not worthy of the love. This is love that loves even if that person has hurt me or grievously wounded someone that I, I care about. This is love that loves no matter what. That's the love that he pushes us for. I was talking with someone about this sermon earlier this week, and they sort of blew it off, and they said, well, you know, there was the Ten Commandments, and those were hard, and then Jesus gave us this new command to love. Well, that one's easy. <laughs> no, not so much. See, in our second lesson, we heard what love is, and that's not easy. Love is patient. That means that even when your kids are bugging you and they don't let you go, you're patient with them. I know as a parent, I fail that. That means when your kids aren't calling and you desperately want that, you're patient with them. It means that when the guy driving ahead of you on the road is going 10 under the limit and you're pulling out your hair, you're actually fine because you're patient with them. It means that when someone is riding your bumper because you're going slower than they want, you're patient with them, too. Can you imagine how much of a better world that would be if we actually did that? If we actually had that level of patience? Wow! Do you know how, how, how much lower our anger rate would be if we actually had that much patience for each other? This world would be so much better! But we don't do that! Our world is broken because we do not love enough to be patient with one another. Love is kind. What that means is that when someone comes up to you and says, Hey, I'm short this week. Can you give me a 20? You never say no. Now, notice I'm not saying you always say yes. But you sit down with them and in love do what is best for them. Maybe that means giving them the 20. Maybe that means saying, you know what, you're always $20 short. Can we do something so we can figure this out so that you don't have this problem anymore? I'm willing to help you figure out a budget or figure out what's going on here so that you're not losing that 20. Can we sit down together? Yeah, I'm not going to give you the 20 because I think that I'm teaching you something bad. But let me teach you something good. And let me guarantee you, having done this, that when you say that to someone who is used to getting 20 from you, it's probably not going to go well. They're probably going to swear at you. Maybe they're going to tell you to do something anatomically impossible. But because love is kind, you don't swear back at them. But instead, you answer, well, I still love you. And I'll help you when you're ready for that. But I'm not going to give you the 20 right now. Let's see if we can figure out something when you're ready. Can you imagine how different this world would be if we all together that way, doing what is best for the other person? Because I'll be honest, like that, instinct is usually, sorry man, I don't have it, whether or not. Response is usually looking at the cell phone and saying, oh, I know what they're calling for, decline. I never got the call. I don't know about you. That, that, that's something that I struggle with. But if we actually had that kindness to not deny someone, but actually do what is best for them every time, imagine how much better this world would be. Don't. We fail to love that way. Love keeps no record of wrongs. I'm not going to keep track of what you owe me. You insulted me and it hurt, but you know what? I'm not going to say that you owe me anything. I keep no record of that. That does not mean that when someone sins, you don't approach and say, look, I love you and you're doing this thing that's wrong and for your good and frankly for my good too, it needs to stop. That's fair and actually good. That's loving. But to keep a record and say, you owe me this much because you've hurt me that much. Love says, no, I'm not going to keep that record. I'm not going to bother. 
Can you imagine how much better this world would be if we did that? How many grudges would just be gone? How many arguments would just stop immediately? And yet we keep a record, don't we? When you see someone that's done you the wrong thing, don't you, don't you just tense up? Or if you kept no record of wrongs, it would just be, okay, whatever. I'm gonna, maybe I'm going to sidestep this person for today, but it doesn't bother me because I didn't keep a record of wrongs. How much better health would you be in? And yet we don't do that. And this is the next blank here. The love that Jesus calls for isn't easy. It's not. It's very difficult. In fact, I'm going to go a step farther and say the love that Jesus demands because we live in a world usually ends in pain. Just listen to this paragraph from our second lesson again and think about how much better your life would be if this happened. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That would be amazing to live in a place like that. Why don't we? Why don't we do it? I heard the word sin. But there's something else. Even before we get there. Why don't we love that way? Because we're afraid to risk it. We're afraid to risk it. A study was done a few years ago that followed married couples. All the couples were married at the beginning of the study. And the study went on, I don't remember if it was 10 or 15 years, but it was a, a fairly significant amount of time. And what the study was doing was trying to figure out why some couples stayed together and why some divorced. And what the study discovered was something called, that they called bids. That one person in the couple would bid for the attention or affection of the other. And it was usually something very small. For instance, the man stoops down to kiss his wife on the cheek. As the husband leaves to work, the wife says, I love you. And they're just bidding for something. Again, it's not a major event. It's not a trip to Cancun. But something relatively small. And what they found is that the couples that stayed Together, when one would bid for the attention of the other, the other would answer the bulk of the time. Not 100%, no one was at 100%, but the bulk of the time. So the husband bent down to kiss the wife, the wife would raise the cheek to accept the kiss. As the husband leaves, the wife calls out, I love you. The husband answers back, I love you. And when those answers were there, the couple was strong. But what happened in divorces is that that bidding would not be answered. The wife would not accept the kiss. The husband would not answer back, I love you. And that rejection, those tiny little rejections would build up over time until the entire relationship was destroyed. So what would happen is that the husband would go in for the kiss and the wife doesn't answer. So the next time the husband doesn't even bother giving the kiss because he knows I'm going to be rejected anyways. Why should I give that? So when the husband doesn't say, I love you, the wife stops saying it because why should she if she's not going to be answered? And so we're not going to risk it. We're not going to risk putting ourselves out there when we're not going to be answered in kind. So that's what happens. That's why we don't love the way that God commands, is that we're scared to risk it. Why should I love? Why should I risk another broken heart? Why should I risk another broken friendship? Why should I risk another broken life? I'm sick and tired of it. It's a lot easier if I just don't. Because all my love ends in pain for me. So why should I risk it? I'm just going to walk away. Maybe I'll go through the motions. I'll be nice to you, but I won't love you. I'll, I'll be kind if I have to, but I'm not going to risk it. Because you know what? I'm sick and tired of it. And so we become the broken ones that refuse to love because we're scared. And that results in something really scary. Like you mentioned, it's sin. Jesus does not say love one another. This will make the world a better place. 
He doesn't say, love one another, because love makes the world go round. He doesn't say, love one another, this is just good advice, and you know, your life will be better if you do it. He says, this is a new command. This is a commandment. This is what you are to do, period. And if you wonder why, consider. I love my wife. She is an amazing blessing. And I want you to pretend that you and I are really good buddies. We go out for coffee, we go out to the bar a couple times a week, and we just have a blast together, and we're good friends. And one day you look at me and say, man, you're great, but I can't stand your wife, and I would not mind if she got hit by a truck. Do you think that I'm going to be friends with you very long? Probably not. Now consider, Jesus loves you. He loves that person just as much. And when you do not love that person, that's what you're telling Jesus. Is that that person that you love? Yeah, I just don't care about him. Whatever. You're slapping him in the face. This is not a little thing. It's a problem. It's sin. And yes, it does send us to hell. Jesus gave a command. Love one another. The way I love you. This is our love here. That's the kind of love Jesus demands. That's the kind of love Jesus provides. See, Jesus says, love each other the way I love you. Sometimes people say, I love you, and you have to wonder if they believe you. You have to wonder if you should believe them. But with Jesus, you don't have to wonder. He said that the night before he died. Some of you know from the book of 1 John, there's a verse that says, God is love. I want to reread you this 1 Corinthians passage with a slight alteration that is doctrinally correct. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. He does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. He is not rude. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. Jesus does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He always protects, always trusts, always, always perseveres. But in this broken world, love nearly always leads to pain. It did for Jesus. He loved you so much. He said, I will pay what you owe. He loved you that much that he said, give me the pain that they deserve so that they don't ever have to feel that pain. If you ever doubt that you are loved, look at a cross. And don't feel guilty. This has nothing to do with guilt. This has everything to do with how much he loves you. This is agape. This is not some sort of teenager first love. Oh, I love you so much, even though I don't know everything that's wrong with you yet. Maybe some of you can remember relationships where you loved someone until you found out who they really were. Jesus knew who you really are. He knew everything. He said, I still love you, and I still die for you. I lay down my life for you. This is a love much bigger than any of us can comprehend. Some of you are blessed to love the person you're sitting next to. Awesome. And praise God for that blessing. As big as that love is, it ain't nothing compared to how much that love is. So imagine how big that love that you feel is, how much bigger this is. This is how much God loves you. 
He came to you in baptism with water and said, You are mine, and no one else may have you. This is how much that Jesus loves you. He doesn't let you go, well, maybe he loves me. But he gives you his word. And in so many ways in the Bible, he says again and again and again, yes, you. This is how far I go for you. Yes, you. I love you that much. This is how much he loves you. He gives you his body and blood in, with, and under the bread and the wine to show you this is how far I go. I love you so much, I give you myself. You can be secure that you are dearly loved. And know this. I said we don't love because we don't want to risk it. If I get a million dollars a month, I really don't, but let's pretend. I get a million dollars a month, amazing paycheck, and that's me. I don't have to share it with a business or anything. I get a million dollars a month. And you come to me and you ask, hey, can I borrow a buck to get a soda? Am I risking anything by giving you a dollar? Of course not. I am giving you something. I am slightly poorer for it, but I'm not risking anything. I mean, I got 999,999 more dollars. I'll give you one. Okay. I'm not risking anything. If I have this much love, if I have that much love from Jesus, I am risking nothing by loving you. It means that maybe I'm not going to get that love back. If I don't get my $1 back from you for my soda, oh darn, I can handle it. It is the same with the love that we offer each other. When I am secure in how much love that Jesus has for me, I am capable and able now to love others selflessly because I'm not risking anything. I might lose that love, and it'll hurt. Yeah, it'll still hurt. But I have so much more love behind me that I can say, okay, I can give more to someone else, to everyone else, because I'm not risking anything anymore. Love recklessly. And I'm going to give you a challenge. We have phileo love here. I, I think I can go out on a limb and say that. We love one another because we have this thing in common, with this congregation in common. I'm going to challenge you. Many of you know that after church, we have snacks and coffee downstairs. And many of you go downstairs. Not everyone does. I challenge you today. As you talk to each other, actually ask some deeper questions. What brought you joy this week? Did something grieve you this week? And listen to the answers you receive. And rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. I'm going to make sure I'm going to give more time after worship before we start Bible study so that I'm not stepping on your toes as you talk to each other. Because as you talk to each other, you may find that there is some deep stuff. And it takes a little bit longer than five minutes to get that out of someone. And that's okay. And I'm going to make that challenge go further. Whoever you talk to, if you don't have their phone number already, get it. And call them up this week. And then ask, hey, how are you doing? You, you mentioned this on Sunday. How is that going? Actually do this. Express that love. Show that. And, and as you talk, if you decide, you know, let's go out for coffee. Let's hit the bar, share a drink. Hey, it's nice out finally. Let's go out to a park and just sit and enjoy the good weather and, and talk. Do that. but express that love to one another. Because Jesus said, by this, all people will know that you are his disciples when you love one another. So express that love. Go out on a limb and risk it. It's worth it.
And you're not risking anything because you have all this love behind you in Jesus. This week, love recklessly. It won't be perfect because we still live in a broken world. But because you know Jesus' love, you can go a whole lot farther than you could before. You are loved. Love one another. Amen. Please stand. Good morning. It is good to be surrounded by family and by people who love each other. I, I mentioned in the sermon, I do encourage you, express that love to one another after worship. Head on downstairs, talk to one another, and share one another's burdens and delights. Uh, a couple of announcements. I'm going to go backwards from farthest away to nearest. First off, in a, roughly a month, we are celebrating Unity Sunday. Starting next week, I'm going to have a lot more information about that. Um, two things that you need to know this far in advance. That Sunday, worship will be at 1030. It'll be a joint service that between our morning service and our evening service, and will be a joint style as well. So it'll be kind of an in-between that'll be a lot of fun. Um, that worship service will be followed with a state of the congregation so you know what's going on, maybe behind the scenes a little bit, and then we're having a potluck. And we would love for you to bring a dish to pass, but so that we make sure that we're balanced and not everyone is bringing jello, as much as I would enjoy that. Um, there's a sign up for food in the back. Please do sign up so that we know and we can make sure that everything is balanced. Um, if everyone brings desserts, again, I wouldn't mind that either, but some, some people want salads, I don't know. Um, so do sign up for that in back. Uh, men, a week from Saturday is Bible and Bacon. May 5th is Ascension. Some people look at that as, it's one more special church service, whatever. But Ascension is a really big deal. Ascension is Jesus' coronation in heaven as he goes back to retake the throne of heaven. And it is a glorious day. We have a joint service between all four churches, actually five churches, depending how you count it, here in town. It'll be held at Freedance. Um, pastor's choir will be singing in that. And there is a joint adult choir. If you want to sing in that joint adult choir, talk to me afterwards worship, and I'll get you the information for when they're meeting, and I'll get you the music as well. Um, after that worship, there is also an ice cream social with a free will offering, and that free will offering supports Oasis, the teen center we host downstairs. So do please make plans to come and check that service out. Saturday. This coming Saturday is Evangelism Day. Um, I would love to do a carpool if anyone wants to go up to Wisco together. That's roughly an hour away. Um, there are sheets on the, in the back there that give information about that. If you want to carpool, let me know. Call me so that we can make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, I'm hoping that we have enough people there that we can actually cover the bulk of the sessions. There's something like 11 sessions, but you can only go to two because you can't be in two places at once. Um, so if you want to come with and you want a carpool and we want to share and figure out where we're all going, please talk to me so that we can get that arranged. Tomorrow is not too late. We had half a session last week. Um, people that were planning on coming to our new Bible study Mondays weren't able to come um, for very legit reasons. Um, for instance, one person that was planning on coming, his mom was dying, so he chose to stay with I come to Bible study. This week we've got a lot more people in there. Check it out. It's a lot of fun. Um, you can talk to Edna, Luann, and Jen. They were all there. You can ask them what it was like so you don't get the propaganda from me. Finally, one more, one more announcement. I mentioned it before, we are having an open house of the Choices of Life Pregnancy Counseling Center. If you want to see what goes on there, if you want to see if maybe you can help out or if you want to encourage them by just showing up and saying, I am interested in this, tell me more. Open house today, 11.30 to 2. Um, I'll be scooting out of be actually early to make sure I can get there since I'm on the board. Kind of important for me to be there. Um, I would love to see you there. Uh, check it out. The information, all the information is right here, including the address. I realize that for some of us, Racine is kind of a mystery. It's not that hard to get there, really. Um, head straight up Sheridan, and there's two more turns, and that's it. All right. Thank you for your patience through all the announcements. Let's join together downstairs. Let's express that love of one another. And let's eat some good food while we're at it, because, you know, you can't be Lutheran unless you're eating something. 
The Lord be with you this week.